This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we've got a special guest on the podcast today. His name is Sean Glass. So he is a retired United States Navy SEAL officer. He was also a combat leader, and now he is a leadership instructor with Echelon Front. So that's the leadership company started by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Sean spent 13 years in the SEAL teams, and he did three combat deployments, one to Afghanistan, one to Iraq, and one to Eastern Africa. So when he returned from Iraq, he actually served as the officer in charge of training for all the West Coast SEAL teams. And this is where he was part of the team, and he specifically spearheaded the development of the leadership training uh, of that of that time period and also he personally instructed and mentored the next generation of SEAL leaders and so this guy has spent the majority of his career dealing with leadership and being just immersed in what's going on not only in combat but also in the boardroom but also he is the co-founder of Primal Beef. So if you've heard me talk about these beef ads here recently, if you've been salivating, if you've been ordering, he is one of the four co-founders of Primal Beef, and he basically heads up their operations. And guys, if you're listening to this on time, Black Friday is here just in a few days. Primal Beef is doing a sale for Black Friday, and so the, the link will be in the show notes, but it's just primalbeefco.com, primalbeefco.com. That link will be in the show notes. So I don't think you'll be able to use my promo code Kyle to get an extra percentage off during Black Friday. But, you know, just in general, the thing with their company is I've been so confused about where to get good beef. And I've had so many people tell me just these horrible stories about buying an entire cow or half a cow and not being the best beef and, you know, being very inconsistent, not really knowing what we're getting from the grocery store. But we spent basically the last maybe 20 minutes of this interview, and it's a long one today, but a great one. We spent maybe the last 20 minutes talking about how their beef product is just very, very different. And there's kind of a three-step process that makes it different than what you're going to buy at maybe a normal butcher or even just from a you know regular old grocery store or something like that. So we get into all that information. But we do talk about his upbringing and some of the things that led him to want to look at the military, but then specifically the SEAL teams. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about buds because obviously you're cold, wet, and sandy and uncomfortable and not very many people make it through. I think we all know that at this point, but really got into the mental minutia of how, what does it take to actually get through once your body is finished. So we talk about that. We talk about his deployments. We talk about some of the biggest misconceptions about what's happening when SEALs are deployed and kind of what they're able to do. I did ask him as well about what about the military? It seems like they're not really focused on readiness and, and lethality right now. It seems like they're focused on DEI and all this other random crap. And so we do talk about that. We talk about his transition out, why he didn't do a full 20 years. And I really liked his reasoning for getting out of the 13 year mark as opposed to doing uh, another seven to get to his 20. And then we, we get into what he does in the private sector, what Echelon Front does, and really just the overall requirement <laughs> Not just benefit, but the requirement of people to focus on their leadership skills and abilities to constantly be sharpening that blade on their leadership. And guys, we talked about a whole lot more stuff. We talked about some whiskey and some gars and soccer. We talked about everything. It was a very, very fun conversation. I wish it could have gone longer, but it's good enough for you guys. So let's just go ahead and get into it right from here. So messed up my outro a little bit here. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Sean Glass, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Well, I appreciate it, Kyle. Thanks for having me, man. Now, where are you right now? Because I think this is the first time in the history of this show that the background, I see like uh, the back of an arrow. I see plywood. Like where are, you, where are we at right now? Yeah. So my home is off stage right over there. And then this is our family uh, pole barn. So this is where we don't have a, a TV in our house at all. So we have a TV in our in our pole barn. So it's very deliberate for my family. If anybody wants to watch a show, like you have to leave the house, we have to come up here together and watch it, but uh, hangout space over here. So the pole barn is just family rec space, basically. So the gym is in there, ping pong tables in there, my bar with all my whiskey and cigars and pipes and stuff is in there. And then this is part of the pole barn and it's my office. So over here, what you can't see is all my guitars, books, computer for work, stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, previous lifestyle stuff right here. And then my, my safe's off to the right. So this is my office. Okay. So you got my ADD going almost immediately because you mentioned cigars, which at least included in that is going to be some undaunted life cigars. So shout out to our own cigars. 
you got one left. Okay. We're going right. to need to remedy that. But then you say you got your whiskey there. So I am a bit of a whiskey aficionado and have become yeah. and developed into a whiskey snob before the oh, pandemic. Yeah. I would actually go and do like whiskey tasting classes. I would teach people like as like a charity event or something like that, you know, the history of whiskey. And then we would do different whiskeys from around the world. I would teach them how to nose it in the Glen Karen and what they should expect on the palate and the finish and blah, blah. And so I basically ruined my palate. I can't drink crap anymore. So, so what do we got on the bar? What are our, what are our go-tos, Sean? Well, I'll give you a, a peek of what's on, or I'm talking through what's on the bar, but you'll notice yeah. this bottle is not on the bar. This bottle is stashed away in my office where you, you can't just come and grab it. But okay. this, is, uh, this is one that stays. Ah, William LaRue Weller, ladies and gentlemen, one of the B-Tacs. That's amazing. What year is it? This is 2017, maybe, is when my uncle gave it to me. Wow, very nice. Yeah. So then my bar is arranged by types of whiskey. So you've got mm -hmm. the uh, scotch on the left-hand side of the bar. Um, I like different kinds of scotch. Basically, my favorite, though, is PD stuff. So uh, Lafroy, Lagavulin, all that good stuff. And then bourbon on the right-hand side. And most of what I have is bourbon. Uh, some gems that people might not have heard of before, but maybe they have. Uh, John or The Duke, a great bourbon. Mm -hmm. It's got John Wayne on the uh, label. So it seems like maybe it's a little bit gimmicky. It's not. It's ridiculously good. And then I think there's three different blends. The one that I have is the silver blend, which I think is their premier one. Uh, it's unreal. Um, and then another hidden one that people have probably heard of is Noah's Mill. But yep. I think they I think they changed their recipe a little while back, or maybe they got bought out or something, because it's not quite so good, but it's not quite the uh the same. And then I have a little bit of Pappy left as well. So my uncle, by my wife's uncle, so now my uncle, awesome guy. He was uh exec for NBC, did some other stuff, and along the journey of his life became a, a sommelier. So he's got an incredible palate, linked up with all these crazy people doing that side of the house and eventually got into whiskey. And uh, when I got back from a deployment, presented me with a bottle of uh, of Pappy. I think it was the 23 year old bottle of Pappy that he had got mm. through some connection. So he got me the Pappy and he got me the William LaRue. So he's a good uncle. Oh right, man, that is he, does he need more nephews? So it's like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm running out of, I'm running out of uncles here, but I will. What's that? You can fit in, man. I'll just tell me one of my kids. I'm like three of my five kids are redheads. You'd fit right in, man. Okay. And if they don't have beards, I'll shave the beard off for some Pappy. I will tell you my favorite bourbon I've ever had is the Pappy Van Winkle 20 year old. I feel like that's kind of the sweet spot for the Pappy. It's got a lot of, you know, red fruit and a, you know, I mean the finish on it just is forever, but I will say as well, our palates are very similar. So I do the same thing. Like because I don't have whiskey that often, maybe just a handful of times yeah. in a month and maybe one or two at a time kind of a deal. But when I bring all my friends over, I'll put my entire collection out on the counter and I start with all the light stuff on the left, you know, the Canadians, the Irish, some of the, some of the blends. And then I get into bourbons and then it's like barrel proof bourbons. And then some of the, the lighter scotches all the way up to the stuff that I like the most, because if I'm drinking, I'm typically having a cigar. And so I want something very, very peaty, very smoky. So I'll have Octomore or Lagavulin 16, mm -hmm. or, you know, you mentioned Lafro or Bo Moore or any of these types, but I got to tell you a quick story and then we'll get off of this. Cause all the like people that want to hear about, you know, all the other cool stuff you've done, they're going to be so like, you know, they're like, what, what is up with you nerds? But when my first son was born, James, uh, a group of my buddies got together and like when James was three or four days old, they came over to the house and they had this uh, Pelican case that they rolled onto my back porch. And I'm like, are they about to like dissect me or something like what, what's about to happen? I don't understand it. And they said, Hey man, you know, we just were, we're so happy for you that you have your first son and blah, blah, blah. And so they got me my Holy grail bottle and it was a bottle of Lagavulin 25 year old. Ooh. And so only 8,000 bottles were made. <clears throat> I had a, a, like an ounce of it, like a couple of years prior to that. And from that day forward, it was my favorite uh, scotch I'd ever had because it was, a log of woolen that was aged in a sherry cask only for 25 wow. years. And so they, they got together with one of uh, a private whiskey collector buddy of mine, and they all threw in to, to give me this bottle. And I popped it immediately. I'm like, we're having this. And they're like, are you out of your mind? I'm like, no, but like, y'all got this for me. Let's honor it. And then I'll, I'll, I'll close the story with this. We drank about uh, half the bottle. And the thing is, is when you get a, a bottle like below half, the whatever's left in there starts to oxidize. If you leave it yeah. in there too long, it can really affect the, the flavor profile. So what I did was 
is I redecanted that half left, which was like 375 mils or whatever. I put that in a small 375 mil bottle and I put a synthetic cork on it and I completely like wrapped up the top of it. And then I made a label of, you know, like made my own label on there, but that is going to be James's birthday present on his 25th birthday. And so it's to James from dad. And so it's good, you know, hopefully, you know, if I'm still there, still around, it's like, I'm going to be able to explain to him, Hey, 25 years ago, some guys thought enough of your dad to, to, to throw down, to get this amazing bottle. And then now you get to have the rest of it and you can do whatever you want with it. Just don't pour it in, you know, Dr. Pepper or something like that. So the world of whiskey, we should probably transition to something else. We should probably talk about something else, but I do want to talk about your early life because you've done some really, really interesting things in adulthood and you, you kind of weaved in and out of a lot of great things that we're going to talk about today. But what was it like growing up Sean Glass? Yeah. Um, I grew up in a small town in Texas called Corsicana. Um, actually didn't grow up in Corsicana, but it's the town where we did all of our school sports, church, stuff like that. So we kind of lived about 20 miles outside of Corsicana on about 60 acres. Uh, parents had different animals, had some horses that we were running for a while, sheep, goats, stuff like that. Basically everything except for cattle probably at one point. So, uh, you know, woke up, did some stuff around the, around the house for the farm, got ready, went to school and that was it. And so what kind of sports did you play growing up? Kind of what, what, what were you into at the time? Like was, cause you know, with small towns, it's kind of hard cause you don't always have all the sports available. It is, it is uh, something I'm extremely jealous of my, my kids is where we are now. They have some, some legit sports. So we had, I went to a very small up until 10th grade. I went to a very small Christian school that some parents from our community basically started called Course Canada Christian Academy. And it was small. So, you know, your sports are limited. I think soccer was the, the biggest team sport we had. And it wasn't like you had a middle school and a junior varsity and a varsity. It was just you had one team and everybody was kind of mm-hmm. on that one team. So soccer growing up, played soccer uh, for the rec leagues, some travel team stuff, basketball for a little bit. But that was really it. And then when I transferred over to the the high school in 10th grade, I was so committed to soccer at that point that even though they had football and baseball and track, I just kind of stuck on the path of soccer. Okay, so what position did you play? I was a defense. I was usually right back. Yeah, not the most skilled. My saving grace was I was very fast. So not a lot of ball skills, but I was, I was, you know, you're probably not getting past me and I can probably chase you down. So I was never going to go to college. I was never going to play professionally, anything like that. But uh, the one thing I had going was I was quick. So as a defender, it's a, it's a nice tool. So I won't go into all the details, but I grew up playing mainly baseball with a little bit of wrestling, but I, I played all sports just kind of like, you know, Sandlot style. But when I went to college, I ended up, somehow becoming the starting goalkeeper for the men's soccer team at my university, University of Central Oklahoma. And the thing is, is like, I'm 5'10". And so when you see goalies, they're typically like 6'3", 6'4", this enormous wingspan. And so it didn't really make sense to people, but I was very aggressive and, and my ball skills were awful. And so I tried to avoid any time where I had to use my feet at all. And so as soon as I got the ball, it was like burning a hole in my hands. And so I would just throw it. You know, because I was an outfielder and so I had a good arm. And so I would never put the ball down. Like I could punt, I couldn't goal kick, any of that type of stuff. But it was just kind of it was just kind of weird how that all worked out. Cause uh, it's it's a great, it's a great sport for people to get into. And again, yeah. the reason why Americans are so bad at soccer on the international stage is because all our best athletes are doing something else and because we're so tough. Because we don't want to yeah. get knocked down to the ground as if we've been sniped by somebody in the 47th row. So we're not no just going to go, you know, flailing around on the ground and go flopping. Okay. Yeah. I so, appreciate the fact that you pointed out after I said I wasn't good enough to play in college that you literally didn't play at all growing up. And then we're on a college team. But but wait, but I, I, I did the caveat of like I had no skills of with course. the feet, which is what yeah. the whole point of soccer is. Mm-hmm. But, Sean, the reason I did that is to make myself feel better because you did a lot of really cool stuff that I didn't do. And so basically this is that one time when I can be like, Sean, suck it. I was better at soccer than yeah. you, and I didn't even have to try. Okay, how about that? But now let's yeah, transition into some stuff that you did that was way cooler than me. So. All right. So, so you're growing up, you, you've got this, you know, seemingly great upbringing. You're, you're very active and all that, but at some point you had to have made the decision 
that you wanted to serve your country and then you specifically decided to try to become a navy seal and so anytime somebody served in the military especially in any type of you know uh special forces or special operations uh type of thing special forces green berets but any type of special operations thing like recon or, or green berets or seals or any of that i'm like okay what what led you number one to even want to serve in the military and the number two why go the elite route not just why not just try to be a grunt or just another guy you know do four years and then go move on and do something else yeah so i'll, I'll have to kind of rewind a little bit and unpack it just a little bit more about childhood to, to kind of fully envelop that story but um yeah. you know childhood was great for a lot of different reasons you know i had space to roam around had a lot of freedom uh, a lot of acreage. I mean, when you're when you're a kid, 60 acres seems like might as well be a million acres. So yeah. uh, in that aspect, really good. Um, some things about family life were great. Some things were not great. You know, we parents got divorced when I was in, uh, I think officially when I was in high school, but they had been separated for a while. And out of respect for my dad, I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but it was uh, not the best situation for sure. But I was kind of I was never like the most disciplined kid growing up. I was never, if you watched me grow up, uh, you probably wouldn't be like, Hey, Sean's going to go into the military, let alone Sean's going to try and do mm -hmm. something, something like that. So, uh, after my parents split up, even though I, in hindsight, when you're reflecting on all these things with some maturity and a little bit more life experience, you, you, you kind of piece all these things together. But obviously I wasn't self analyzing myself as a 13 or 14 year old, but Looking back, um, just kind of floundering, pissed off at a lot of different things that were going on in life. Like most kids who have a self-centered view, um, didn't really know how to deal with all that stuff, uh, manifested in different ways. That wasn't like a troublemaker or anything like that, but just frustrated, angry. And one thing that was always pretty constant in my life was I was always a, a big reader. Ever since I was a kid, like always reading a book, always had a book in my hand, you know, probably read five, six different books a month. And we would spend a lot of time at our public library because of that. You know, you'd go, you'd pick up a book, a couple books, make it through uh, the month, go back, pick up some more. And I was in the military section one day. I was probably, I'll be 14. And uh, I saw this book about SEALs in Vietnam. And keep people have to keep in mind, this is 1995, 1994, something like that, where there just wasn't a whole lot of information out about SEAL. So I didn't even know what the heck a SEAL was. Uh, mm -hmm. Had a cool photo, dude with a green face in a jungle. I was like, this looks legit. Let me, you know, pick it up and give it a, give it a read. And um, I was fascinated and, and captivated. And again, not realizing all these things as a kid, I just was like, Hey, this is what I, this is what I want to do. Rewinding the clock and, and looking at it from my perspective right now, I really think it was, uh, God's way of kind of laying a path out from my life and just basically saying, Hey, here's something. It's a potential thing. You can try it. Could be good for you. Uh, but you've got to be willing to, to walk that path basically. So, um, it changed the whole course of my life when I read that book. So to me, I'm like, there's probably some divine providence there and, uh, young frustrated man getting shown a path for the potential to move forward, do something with your life and really at the time, probably get me not focused on all those things that I probably shouldn't have been focused on and focused on something a little bit more positive. So when I read that book, it was like a, a switch. It was like, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, I read everything I could get my hands on about it. I started reading about working out and training and stuff. And, you know, I was an athlete for soccer, but like I never lifted weights. I never did anything on my own. I would just show up to practice and whatever the heck we were doing that day for practice, like that was my my workout. But Obviously, if you want to pursue something like that, you've got to make some some pretty drastic sacrifices as far as PT and stuff like that. So the book was kind of what started, not kind of, it was straight up what started me on the journey to wanting to become a SEAL. And then the more I found out about it and the more I found out about it, the more I was just convinced that this is what I wanted to do. And I at least had to give it a try. And so I, I've heard very similar stories to guys that are kind of in your generation. Like I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, 
uh, Jack Carr and, and Eddie Penny and some of these people, like maybe it was like they went to, I think Eddie Penny was like, he was at a Cincinnati Bengals game. And I mm-hmm. think there was like the, the honor guard was there and there was just something about it that, that really spoke to him. But it's typically that story. It, it's not typically the story of, yeah, you know, I was 19 and then dropped out of college and I was just kind of floundering. And then I figured, uh, hell week's probably not going to be that bad. Like it's typically <laughs> something where they, they have some years at least of mental prep. So, so give me an idea. Let, let's talk a little bit more about that. So, so you, you start, you know, working out, you're changing your workout regimen, you're learning more as you go. But at some point there had to be a launch because there are people that do the same thing. Like <clears throat> let's say, let's take soccer. So maybe they're a really good high school soccer player. And so they're thinking about what playing at the next level would be like. And so they start preparing to do that. Maybe they're trying to get on certain travel teams or they're trying to get exposure to certain coaches and, and soccer is a little bit different, but you know, there, there's eventually that point where it's like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to burn the ships and I'm going to at least give it a go. So, so walk me through to that moment yeah. where you're like, no, I'm going to sign on the dotted line and try to do this. Yeah, I mean, obviously for the military, you can't sign on the dotted line until you're 18, uh, unless mm-hmm. it's World War II and you're the man and you're lying about how old you are and you're actually 14. Right. You probably can't get away with it anymore. But so for me, the process was, you know, I was like 14 at the time, so it wasn't even possible for me to to enlist or start the journey for another four years. So it was just work out, uh, started running a lot, started swimming a lot, and then decided – Around that time, I was going back and forth on, hey, do, do I want to go the enlisted route? Do I want to go the officer route? Because they're two very different routes. If you want to be an officer in the military, you have to have your college degree. So, you know, that pushes the timeline back even further because you can't get a college degree at 18 unless you're Doogie Hauser, which I was definitely not Doogie Hauser in school. So uh, I decided to go the officer route. So but I, I was, if you could have given me a dotted line to sign on, I would have signed on it when I was 15 years old. I'm very glad I didn't because I think I needed the college experience to really get me prepared and, and in shape for that journey. Because up until college, I thought I was in good shape and I thought I was in good shape because I was doing everything by myself. Uh, you know, there was nobody else in my hometown that wanted to do anything similar to this. So, you know, I'd go to school, I go to practice and then our only gym was the YMCA. So I'd go run, I'd go to the YMCA, I'd lift. And then two to three days a week, I would swim. And in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm the most in shape dude on the planet. Uh, in Corsicana, Texas population, not that many, right? So I go to college and I start working out with some other guys that wanted to do the same thing. And the first run we went on was this experience of, I am nowhere near as in shape as I thought I was because these guys were like actually in shape. These guys were just animals. They were turning in like a couple of them, 16 minute, 20 second, three miles, like just freaks. So mentally, I think uh, obviously pushing yourself harder and harder and harder prepares you mentally. I think mentally, if I would have went in at 18, I probably would have been okay. But physically that experience of college working out with with guys like that, iron sharpens iron, pushing yourself, making yourself better, uh, really set me up for success. So as soon as I graduate, my whole college experience was trying to get a slot to go to Bud's as an officer, because you can walk into a recruiting station and you can sign on the paperwork right then and right there if you want to enlist. And like a week later, you're going to be on a bus heading to uh, boot camp. It's not the process for officers. There's a selection process you have to go through They only do the board once a year. Um, You have to be in the certain zone. So it's not like I could apply as a freshman in college. You have to be your senior year. So wait, 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 wait. And then I applied. Uh, Thank goodness I got picked up for a spot at officer candidate school and graduated college. And it wasn't immediate. I was thinking it was going to be immediate. It was still about a year after I graduated. But I graduated knowing that at least I was going to get to go to butts. I knew it was going to happen. Okay. So the thing with buds is by this point, everyone has seen the movies. They've read the memoirs. They've gone through all that. I get it. It's hard, cold, wet, and Sandy. And it's, you're just miserable for a long time. Who's going to carry the boats? Like that's not necessarily what I'm, what I want to talk about. I think everyone by this point knows what you went through, but I want to dig a little bit more into your psyche. So, so we're, we're fast forwarding a little bit here. You've gotten in, you've gotten your chance to go to buds. Obviously you became a Navy SEAL. So you made it through uh, that selection process. I want to know about the, the mental part. 
Physical, we get it. They push you to physical exhaustion almost immediately, and then they keep you there basically for, for months on end. But mentally, I tell people to do this all the time, Sean. I'm like, if you're not redlining at least once a week in your workouts, you need to figure out some new workouts. And what I mean by redline is where you're like, I literally could not have gone another step. I literally could not have pumped out another rep. And you're just like, you're in that panic mode where you're like, my heart rate's never going to come back down. And then you keep going. Like, that's the part where you tell your inner, you know what, hey, shut your mouth. Like, I've got stuff to do. And, you know, you just kind of push through that. That's what I want to talk about. So take me through the mental aspect of what you had to go through. Yeah. If you show up to Bud's, and by that I mean if you have earned a spot to get to Bud's, you have everything physically that you need to get through. Some people are going to have a harder time physically than others because some people have more natural attributes. Some people prepared harder. But if you showed up to Bud's, if you earned a spot to get there, that means that you were screened pretty heavily at this point. And it means that you have the physical traits that you need to get through. And it's 100% the mental thing that separates uh, who makes it and who doesn't make it. And the biggest thing that gets people, and I was later on in my career, I, I ran one of the phases of BUDS. I ran the, the third phase, the final phase of BUDS. So I got to see it from the, the opposite perspective. It's people that lose sight on the day-to-day. If you're just going evolution to evolution, you'll be fine. It's when people tend to look at, oh my goodness, it's day three and I've got seven more months of this. And then even after I graduate that, I've got seven more months of selection after buds before I make it. So it's when people lose the focus of just make it through this next evolution. This next Sean, evolution is going to stop. But the one before let me that ask sucked, you. Right. Let me ask you this real quick uh, before I lose the thought, because uh, I've heard this before and I, I didn't know if this was true or not. But since you were in that last phase, I've heard that one of the first evenings of Hell Week or something like that, like, you know, sometimes they would put people on the beach and make you look out on the horizon as the sun is going down. And then it's basically like a lot of guys would quit at that moment because they couldn't fathom what the week would entail. As opposed to, you know, because they were trying to eat the whole elephant at once, right? To use a, a leadership business guru uh, example, as opposed to just, I have to take this bite right now. I've got to take this bite right now. Is that true? Do you have a bunch of people that get all the way to hell week and they just get to that moment to where they're not even doing something physical in that moment? It's just the mental side of like, crap, I don't think I have what it takes to make it the next few days. Yeah, the most people, the highest attrition rate is hell week. And the, the thing that gets most people in hell week is the breaks. When you get to sit down for a lunch, when you get to sit down for breakfast, you go rejoin your class after that breakfast and there's significantly less people than there was before. Um, mm. You just have time to reflect. You have time to, same thing with the sun going down and waving at it. It's a mental game of, hey, you've got six more days of this, five more days of this, whatever the case may be. So it's a lot of times not in the motion. Don't get me wrong, the motion gets a lot of people. It's in the quiet times when you have time to actually process, hey, this is the first breakfast and I've got to do six more of these breakfasts without sleeping before this evolution is is over with. And it definitely gets a whole lot of people. And people that are in isolation don't do very well throughout BUDS. You know, I don't think anyone's making it through BUDS that doesn't lean on their boat crew and lead on their teammates very heavily. And just the nature of the beast is if you're not a good performer, if you're dragging your boat crew down or you're just selfish and no one likes you, you're getting isolated. And I don't think anyone's making it through that program uh, isolated. So keeping the focus on the here and now and then just relying on your teammates, just understanding that you're all going through it together, which is the awesome part about being a part of a boat crew is you've got six to seven other individuals right there that are going through the exact same thing that have the exact same drive and focus and goal and you can lean on each other and you can you know get strength from each other and there's going to be moments when you're more tired than the other guys and there's going to be moments where they're more gassed than you are uh, and that's the beauty of being surrounded by such high caliber individuals okay let's talk a little bit more about that there is a uh, let's call him a very famous former seal a retired seal who has a as far as I can tell, not a great reputation inside the SEAL teams. Uh, he's a very me-focused guy, a very solo guy, a very I'm going to do it and I'm better than you type of thing. And 
So talk to me a little bit more about that solo versus team focus, because you don't get through buds as a team. Like you're not evaluated as a team. You're, you know, technically you're evaluated as an individual. They don't say, all right, you know, boat team two, you guys made it through, you, you know, you finish hell week, you go through it as an individual, but you're absolutely right. If you don't have those people around you that can take some of the burden off of you or that you can take some of the burden off of them, it's going to be very, very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to make it through. But let's just say one of these seals that is super solo, focus on themselves, very, very selfish, makes it through buds. <clears throat> Do the officers that are that are that are taking care of, of this and in and, and the instructors and the other guys, is that a reputation that follows a guy once they've been put onto a SEAL team and oh, they're gonna be either West Coast or East Coast? Or is that something to where it's like, hey, he had to do what he had to do to get through buds, but now let's see if he can be a teammate. Does that make sense? For sure. It it 1000% follows you. And what I would say to the, Hey, you're selected on an individual basis is yeah, you make it through buds on an individual basis, but the instructors are viewing everything through the lens of the team the entire time. So okay. yeah, you've got to perform. You've got to meet all the standards. Most evolutions and buds are not team evolutions. Most evolutions and buds are single physical evolutions, runs, uh, swims, you have a swim buddy. So runs, O course, PTs, all those things are, are solo. So you have to make it through as an individual, but the entire time the cadre is, is looking at it through the lens of the team and how this person is interacting with the team. Now, historically, there was a, a, a lot of people that made it through that weren't probably going to ever be the best teammates because all we were focusing on as instructors was can they make it through the program? Are they physically and mentally capable of making it through the program? Around 2011, there was a, a shift. You had a very well-respected commanding officer come in and take over the BUDS pipeline. And he wanted to kind of change how we selected people up. You still had to meet all the physical requirements. Nothing physically changed. But he wanted to correct for what he called a selection error. And the selection error was... High performers, horrible teammates. We don't want those people. We want high performers, good teammates, or we want good performers, great teammates. We don't want high performers that are bad teammates, and we, we can't allow poor performers that are good teammates either. So we started selecting people based off the physicality, but then we started putting in all these other measures as well to try to get a better snapshot for what the individual is and how he functions on a team. So basically imagine... Uh, a graph, a chart where it's split up into, into quadrants. So you have four quadrants and you would have good teammate, good performer, bad teammate, bad performer. And we would lean more towards the guy that was struggling performance wise, but was just the best teammate, like hard to go do anything for his people. We would rather have that guy than we would the high performer that was just out for themselves. So when that paradigm shift changed, we started to see a little bit of a correction. It looked no system is perfect. You're still going to get people through that uh, aren't necessarily the people that you would want to have through, but it helped out a lot. Now, yes, your reputation starts in buds and it goes with you throughout the rest of your career. And those instructors that, and we always heard this, like, hey, those instructors that are, that are with you right now, you're going to be in platoons with them. And you're like, oh, okay, sure, whatever. Sure I am. No, I was two of my first phase instructors were my platoon chief and my lead petty officer when I checked into my first platoon. When I was a troop commander, I had a whole bunch of my buds instructors were working for me. Um, so your reputation definitely starts right there in buds. And it's hard to shake. It's hard to shake. It's not impossible, but it's hard to shake. That's really interesting how you bring that up. I wasn't aware of that. That shift that y'all made, <clears throat> it, it reminded me of there was this guy that wrote this book where he did this research on team captains. So take the elite of elite teams all across the globe and all kinds of different sports. And they had a lot of common, a lot of things in common, a lot of similarities. And one of the similarities is that coming up in their sport. So let's say it's soccer and you're talking to, <clears throat> you know, Zinedine Zidane, whatever he was the captain of, you know, the, the French team or whatever. A lot of these guys, he, he he was a terrible example because he was always the best guy on the team. But a lot of these team captains, they were not the best player on their junior high school team. They were not the best player on their high school team. They were not the best player on their 
maybe <clears throat> their college team or something like that, but something clicked along the way that made them elite at whatever they did, but it wasn't their soccer skills that were elite in comparison to their leadership skills and their teammate skills, because that's how these people end up becoming captains. And, and you see that across sports. You'll see guys that have the C on their jersey. They're not always the best player on the team. Sometimes they are, but that's kind of something it seems like y'all, you know, were, you know, a uh, correcting for, which was we need to find these people that are just super duper teammates. And then the other stuff will come along. And that's part of the job of the cadre is to make sure that person, if they do have a physical deficiency, not an injury, but a deficiency that we get them up to snuff, especially if they are a good team player. So that that's really interesting that you bring that up. <laughs> and so yeah, if you, if you look at what really makes a successful organization, whether it's the military, whether it's civilian, whether it's a sports team, it's you're selecting people. So you, there has to be a, a baseline for who gets to join the team. You have really good training specific to that job set. And then you have a really good, strong culture that keeps people in line with what the goal of that mission is. And that's why typically military does well. Special operations forces do really well is they're selected. We spend a lot of time training, but you're just a part of a culture that doesn't really tolerate the the selfishness very well people that are selfish it, it happens you know i've met plenty of selfish people in the military but in general uh it's a self-correcting problem once you get inside of your your first platoon okay very good so let's talk about your first platoon because uh, as people kind of colloquially know now you get into a platoon you have a certain team that you're assigned to either east coast west coast and then uh i'm assuming you got into a platoon when the gwat was already off and going right Yep. So 2008, I checked into uh, SEAL Team 7 and just had the best first platoon that you could possibly have. My platoon chief, who I said previously was one of my BUDS instructors, was the guy that I looked up to the most going through that program. And it's still in my mind. He's the epitome of what a, what a, a SEAL should be. And on top of all of that, he was a great family man. He had uh, five kids, Four were his. One was a niece that he had adopted because his uh, sister-in-law had some issues. So he had a great reputation. Like He can't get a better reputation. Super hard worker. And he was also a great family man. So to see someone as a new guy getting to look up to someone like that, be like, this guy's the total package. This guy's a stud. He knows everything about this community. He cares. He pushes himself. He pushes all of us. And on top of all the dedication he has here, He's also just a great family man for, for a young man who was uh, engaged at the time to, to my, my wife. Now it was a blessing to see, okay, it's possible. Like you can have a balance. You can still be a good father and you can still be a good seal. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about that then, because also a thing that's commonly known to anyone paying attention is that in the spec ops community, divorce rates are through the roof. They're way higher than normal divorce rates. And so it's interesting to hear you talk about how you were engaged. You, you know, had a long career as a SEAL. You got out and you're doing your stuff and you're still married. Like I, I was honestly shocked to hear you say that just because you don't normally hear that. What, was that basically because of, of that guy that you met where you kind of modeled after him or was it just like you and your wife are awesome together and you're, you know, you're ride or die and, you know, you were going to make yeah. it regardless? I think it's a little bit of both. You know, there's definitely a, a learning curve with marriage, new marriage, and there's definitely a very steep learning curve with new marriage and then, you know, a military training cycle. But for both of us getting to 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 watch this guy and his wife and how they loved each other and treated each other and raised their family and still prioritized his job. It definitely set us up for, for success. Now, I think my wife and I are a great pair and, you know, Hey, step one, choose wisely fellas. Like, amen. Let's be honest. Um, a lot of people probably don't have the right conversations before they get married. And, you know, my wife and I, we dated for four months and then I asked her to marry me because I knew she was, she was the one, but in that four months, we had so many important conversations that gave me and her like total peace of mind that this was, this was, you know, Providence that it was basically meant to be. So choose wisely. And then look, the teams are super important, but you know, my family was important, even more important. I've only ever had two goals uh, as a man. And that was to be a seal and to be a good husband and a good father. So 
if being a seal ever came in conflict with that, then the nod was going to get to go to the family. But, you know, we communicated really well. My wife is a rock star. She's not someone that if, if we're frustrated, she's letting me know, which I appreciate. There's no silent treatment. There's no pinup uh, frustrations or aggression or anything like that. Like we're just figuring it out right then and right there in a productive manner. Like we've literally never had a fight and that's not a miracle. It's because we talk, we talk about everything. So um, part of it's choosing wisely. Part of it is keeping the focus on where it needs to be, which is a healthy relationship. And then part of it is modeling your your marriage and your life together around people who have succeeded. Because there's plenty of negativity around marriage and SEAL teams. Plenty of negativity. Yeah, that certainly seems like it would be the case. Now, something you've mentioned several times in this interview so far, Sean, is <clears throat> the word providence. And God's hand working in getting you to that library where you read that book, where you were put on a path uh, or, you know, meeting your wife or, you know, making it through buds, all these types of things. So there are a lot of people that can't really square the circle of how a follower of Christ can take a job where one of the aspects of your job is to kill people. And, you know, we can get into just war theory and we can get into innocent versus not innocent and all that type of stuff. But it reminds me of a of a conversation I had years ago with Bill Rapier, a very similar, you know, <clears throat> Navy SEAL ended up going to the development group uh, SEAL Team 6. And, you know, he's a guy that <clears throat> has ended the lives of a lot of bad people. And hearing him explain how he got through that was very interesting. But I'm just curious for you, because we haven't even talked about your deployments yet, because as far as I understand, you went to Afghanistan, Iraq and Eastern Africa. And in each one of these deployments, you're not there to give people rides. You're not there to, you know, just shake hands with with the village folk. <clears throat> you're there potentially to to take human life. So just just walk me through all that, because a lot of people just don't understand how a Christian could do any of that. Yeah, it's definitely a deep philosophical question that I'm probably not going to offer anybody any mm, light bulb moments on. But um, these aren't good people. These are people that are doing really bad things to other people to include their own countrymen. And part of, I think, being a man and part of being a follower of Christ is also looking out for people who can't look out for themselves. And going overseas, knowing that that was going to be a part of the job was never really in conflict with my my worldview because uh, I looked at it more along the lines of, of helping people who through most of the time, no fault of their own, we're stuck in situations that uh, let's just say we're less than ideal. Like anybody that wants to have a conversation with me about members of ISIS and whether they deserve to be breathing the same air that we have to breathe, I'll sit down with you all day long and we can have that conversation. And I'll run you through every single thing that we had to sit there and watch those people do to their, uh, their fellow man. So for me personally, it was more of just understanding that um, by doing something like that, you're, you're protecting people, not just people back here in our country, but the people that are there, that a lot of them are just there because that's where they were born and they don't have a choice and they don't have a way to get out of that. And those people are doing really, really horrible things. So there was not one night where I didn't uh, have a good night's sleep, at least uh, there's plenty of nights where I haven't slept well, but there's not not because of any concern of that. I think it's also interesting. Uh, this came up recently when Hamas obviously did the terrorist attack in Israel. And I, I, I was talking to my Sunday school class about a week later, and I was going through the list of atrocities because I was like, look, guys, within a couple of weeks, you're going to start hearing people saying, why is Israel being so mean? Why aren't they just, why can't they just do a ceasefire? Why can't we all just play nice and make nice? And the reality is, is because you, if you think that way, you have a low view of evil in that you either think that most people are generally good and they, they have a good heart, but maybe they had a rough bringing or rough upbringing, or maybe if they had more economic opportunities, they wouldn't choose to, you know, chop people's heads off. And it's just like, no, these people are driven by a satanic demonic ideology that causes them to hurt uh, people and to keep human flourishing from taking place. And I said this and not everybody really liked that. I said this and I've said it before on the show as well, that I said that we should pray for the Hamas fighters that perpetrated these attacks in two ways. Number one, 
We should pray that they should repent of their actions and turn to Christ and accept his free gift of grace for salvation. And then we should pray that if they don't do that, that they get killed quickly. Because if you let people like that live, they will continue to hurt, damage, rape, and kill image bearers of Christ. And so that's kind of how for me, like when I think of a Christian that is in that line of work, it's like, we're here to equip men to push back darkness here at Undaunted Life. That's the front lines of darkness. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. And part of it is probably a, a perspective in that they've never actually seen or been involved or been engaged with anything like that. But part of it is also just a deep fundal, fundamental misunderstanding of human nature and good and evil. And this belief that we have, and I say we is a Western society who is has the blessing of growing up with a whole lot of freedoms. Um, and it can shape our perspective in thinking that everybody's like this. They're just not. There's different belief systems. There's different pathologies. There's all kinds of different things that leads to it. But um, there's definitely evil out there. And like you said, evil doesn't just stop. It just continues and continues and continues. And, you know, there's also examples of evil just collapsing on itself, like the terrorist organizations that are out there. They don't like each other. So if you've got a situation like in Africa where you've got Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda and all these things, like they're fighting each other, too. They hate they just hate everybody. So there's the odds that evil collapses in on itself, but it's not historically what usually happens. It continues to grow and grow and grow until it runs up against the opposite force, which is a force for good. And you can just look, the most recent one that was on a large scale was the Islamic State. You know, in 2013, they weren't really even a thing. And then within a couple of years, they're controlling most of Syria, almost all of Iraq, the largest city in Iraq. They completely controlled all of it, doing all these different atrocities, trying to continue to expand their war and their slaughter all over uh, that continent, all over Europe, bring it to America. And you can sit in your bubble and just hope that at some point in time, they're going to change their minds, but they're not. They're certainly not going to. And I think you're right. You don't allow them because I've heard, you know, different policy wonks say, oh, you know, just let them fight it out amongst themselves. It's like, are we really going to wait to see if ISIS is taken out by Boko Haram? Is that really what we're going to do right now? Is that the best uh, use of our of our forces and our time? Um, I do want to talk briefly about your deployments because you did deploy multiple times to all different areas in the Middle East and Africa. We don't have to get into individual missions and different things like that, like unless you want to, then, I, then I'm all ears. I'm just curious about the biggest misconceptions that people have when when people deploy, because, yes, there are some people that deploy and they're on the base. and They never go outside uh, the wire. And I mean, they're, they're there and they're they're generally safe the whole time. And then there's guys like you that are getting kinetic on a regular basis. But talk to us a little bit about the op tempo. Talk to us a little bit about about that. But for a civvy like me, explain to us some of the misconceptions about when a SEAL deploys. Yeah, I, probably the one of the largest misconceptions is that we're all just um, supermen and there's nothing that possibly phases us and we don't have bad habits and we don't have to continually fight against complacency and laziness and at times exhaustion and potentially even fear and all those things. And it's just categorically not true. The military, to include special operations forces, are comprised of human beings and human beings come in different shapes and sizes and different capabilities. But at the end of the day, we're all intrinsically flawed. So you go overseas and there's going to be times where you're exhausted. There's going to be times where you don't feel like taking things quite as seriously as you possibly probably should, because it's your hundredth combat operation, that deployment and not your first combat operation. So you could potentially get lulled into a sense of complacency. Uh, maybe the operation right before that you watched a friend or a partner force get cut in half by a roadside bomb. And then there's the fear of, Hey, that could have been you. What happens if you go out tomorrow? Maybe that same thing is going to happen. And all of those thoughts are plaguing um, all of us too. And the, the thing that makes it to where we can overcome those things, I think for me personally was two things. One is just discipline. Like you don't get to that point and be able to fight those things off. If you have not cultivated a certain amount of discipline because that's what it takes to fight complacency. That's what it takes to put that fear 
uh, back inside or the exhaustion back inside is just the discipline of doing the right thing, even when you don't feel like doing the right thing. And then the other thing is you've got your brothers right there beside you and they're a consistent source of, of strength. You don't want to let them down. You're accountable to them. You know, I'm accountable every single time that we go on an operation to make sure that I am the best version of Sean that I can possibly be before we roll out the door, because the people to my right, the people to my left are depending on that. So a, a big miscategorization would probably be that it's easy, that you're just out there and, you know, you don't have to ever worry about those things. Do we love being on deployment? Yes, we would rather be deployed than literally anywhere else. But those same things that happen in everyday life, the exhaustion, the annoyance, the uh, doubt, all those things, we have to struggle against all those things as well. Okay, so one of the things you mentioned there, Sean, was fear. <clears throat> in a very micro way, I've experienced like primal fear before. I thought there was somebody that had broken into our house in the middle of the night. So here I am, you know, clearing <clears throat> in the dark kind of a thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's something that was just par for the course for you guys. That That's just something that you had to do. You were constantly in danger when you were out on missions. You did not know what was on the other side of the door. You couldn't always trust your intel. You know, things were changing all around you. And, you know, the consequences for mistakes is potentially paid with your life. But specifically with fear, and you also mentioned doubt, how do you deal with that? Because part of it's like, yeah, you got dudes around you and you kind of have a sense that they're afraid too, but you're the one that's going to control you. Like you can't control all circumstances, but you can control you. But how do you deal with the fear and doubt? Yeah. So I'll talk to us specifically because it's, it's a long process and then maybe some things that just for everyday life to kind of keep in mind too. One is look, we, we have an advantage. We screen people for this stuff. There's a lot of evolutions in buds that even though the students don't know it, we're just seeing who can keep, calm when we're literally putting him in the scariest environment imaginable. So we're putting you underwater with a scuba tank on, and then we're ripping your mask right. off and we're tying your hose in knots. We're taking your fins. We're doing all the, we're tumbling you around. So you don't know where you are. And then you have to follow a certain strict order of procedures to get your hose untangled, to get your air turned back on. You're not breathing for a minute minute, 20 seconds at a time while you're doing that. So we're putting people in a scenario that does two things. One, it screens people out who, when they have the fight or flight uh, response that they fly, they choose the opposite. So we're screening for that, but it also teaches people that they can control that. It teaches people that aren't necessarily gonna run away, but who still experience that fear that you can still control that fear and get things done. So we do select people for that. Training. We train harder than anyone on the planet. Like we're gone. Basically, when I was running the training command, our, you know, an average SEAL platoon on a year where you're training, you're going to be gone 240, 250 days out of the year just training. That training is hard. That training is pushing you past your, your breaking point. So training, relying on your guys that are right there is a huge piece of it. But it all just comes down to a choice. It's that easy. And it's that difficult at the same time. It's a choice. There's no such thing as a person who doesn't experience some level of fear. But when you experience that fear, it comes down to the choice that you're going to make. And uh, a very small example I'll give is my first deployment. Uh, my vehicle early on in deployment, we'd already hit a roadside bomb. So I'd experienced what was like being hit by an IED inside of a vehicle, which was not the coolest thing. But then later on in that deployment, uh, we're conducting this operation and some partner force guys, some local Afghani that was about five feet away from me. And there was Americans on his right and his left stepped on a pressure plate that was connected to two eighty four millimeter mortars. And it blew both his legs off, blew part of his arm off. Uh, and I'm sitting right there. Like I'm watching all these things. We're rendering aid. We're getting things ready. And then my platoon chief, that guy that I respected a whole lot, made the call that he needed to go check out another piece of terrain to see if it was safe because we didn't want to be there anymore. And was I not wanting to walk? Yeah, I was not wanting to walk literally anywhere because I had just watched someone step on an IED five feet away from me. But I had a choice to make, which was, hey, I can either go back my chief up and go with him, or I could sit here and just stay right where I am. And I knew that I needed to overcome that fear. I needed to take that next step. I needed to go with him. 
um, not just to protect him, but also to shake that fear off and just get right back to it. So ultimately, it's a choice. You're going to experience fear in your life. And it's as easy as making the choice. And it's also as difficult as making the choice because there's no magic pill you can swallow that's going to make you, uh, you know, Superman. Well, and I think as well, you mentioned discipline there. If you can go back to your discipline. So think about it like not in a combat scenario, guys, listen to this. Let's say you're coming back from a serious injury. Maybe you've had surgery or something like that. But let's say before that surgery, <clears throat> you had spent years, if not decades, in a very disciplined approach to your training. So you hurt your knee, take that disciplined approach to rehabbing your knee. And then whenever you're at a good place, get back to the squats, get back to the box jumps, get back to the waltzes, get back to the whatever the thing is that you're going to need. But if you don't have that discipline, if you don't have that basis, if you don't have that foundation, you don't have anything to fall back on. And that's one of the reasons why I tell people that they need to train and do physically hard things all the time because you never know when you're going to need to take you know, a withdrawal out of that bank account, but you need to be putting deposits in there, deposits every day, moving your body, doing stuff you don't want to do, waking up early to do it because one day you're going to need to take a withdrawal. Now there's more that could be said about a lot of your deployments and the things that you did. But when you came back from a deployment in Iraq, and I think I have these details correctly, uh, you became the officer in charge of training for all the West Coast SEAL teams. And so basically you were put in charge of developing the leadership training programs for this group of people, right? So this was obviously a good experience for stuff that you would end up doing thereafter. But take me through that process. Is that kind of where you were working with, with Jocko Willink on different things on this lead, these leadership programs? Why did the Navy decide like, hey, we need to get these, you know, train killers to be better leaders. Like to take me through that whole process. Why that even was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let me rewind one second. Cause I want to make a comment on the discipline thing that you just talked about. Yeah, and yeah. Just as someone who I'm not saying the most disciplined person in the world, but I I've been able to cultivate a decent amount of discipline in my life. And uh, as a man, also as a Christian, you discipline is going to be probably the most important trait that you can possibly have. Um, at no point in time did Christ ever say that being a follower of him was going to be easy. Matter of fact, this is the exact opposite as many times as he could possibly say it was <laughs> right. You're basically opening yourself up to just a, a, a hard life in a lot of different aspects. And it's so important. Discipline is so important that there's seven cardinal virtues and discipline is one of them, but we call it fortitude. Fortitude and discipline are basically the exact same thing. So, uh, Christians throughout the years have kind of settled on seven virtues that really are really, really important to walking a life of faith and discipline called fortitude is one of them. And the good thing about discipline is like you hinted at, uh, there's no easy button, but the more that you do it, the more discipline that you apply to different areas in your life, the easier it gets to be disciplined, the easier it gets to tell you know, your internal struggles to, to shut down, like your internal self, your self-doubt, it becomes easier to uh, do what needs to be done, to do the hard things that need to be done, to push yourself, to have the good habits. The opposite is also true. No matter how much discipline you have, the second that you start letting that backslide, then it becomes easier to say yes to the things that you shouldn't be saying yes to. So I would just say, understand the importance important role that discipline plays in a man's life, especially in a man of face life as a husband, as a father, discipline is going to be one of the, if the not predominant factors in whether you're actually going to be successful in all those different arenas. And there's no easy button. You just have to do it with the Amen. knowledge that the more that you do it, the easier it will become. Um, right. That being said, so fast forwarding to training. So I get back from uh, a tour in 2016 where I was a troop commander. So I took five platoons from SEAL Team 5 to Iraq, uh, and we did the big push against the Islamic State. So did the Mosul clearance, cleared them out of Mosul. We come back. I wanted to stay at Team 5, so I became the operations officer of Team 5. So you're the third in command. You got the commanding officer, the executive officer, and the operations officer. But the operations officer works directly with the commanding officer. You're running the team basically for the commanding officer. He says, this is what I want to have happen. This is what I want to focus on. Operations officer does that. After that tour is when I got pulled up to, to run 
the training command. So it was a 20, I think 17 when I got pulled up to go run that. And your my job there is multifaceted. My job one, the most important job I have is to provide the best possible training, safe, aggressive, hard training that you can to prepare SEALs for war. So that's job number one. Job number two is uh, if you are an officer that's running an operation overseas, the military likes to use different terms for, for things. So you're a platoon commander, but the second you go on a mission, you're the ground force commander. And what that title means is you're the one that's responsible for everything that's happening during that operation, everything that's happening on the battlefield. If you're the ground force commander, you're in charge of those things. The SEAL teams put a whole lot of effort into training our ground force commanders, into making sure that we had the best ground force commanders that you could possibly have. So my favorite part of my job at that role was I was got to mentor the up and coming leaders, the up and coming platoon commanders that were coming through to talk about how to be good ground force commanders, to do the theory of it, the practice of it, the mentoring of it, the grading of it. And then the last part of my job, which is necessary, but it's never the most fun thing is when people aren't cutting it, making the recommendation that they need to, to be removed. So if you had a leader that came through and after a process of trying to get them where they needed to be, if, if they just weren't there, then, you know, we'd have to remove them, remove them from training. So uh, a lot of impetus was put on making sure that our leaders were prepared because leadership is the most important thing on the battlefield. Your guys, if you're in a SEAL platoon, they will literally knock down a brick wall and chew through a sand berm in order to get the job done. And the determining factor usually in whether they are set up for success and allowed to actually get the job done is who's in charge of them. Is the leader doing the right things? Is he setting the right conditions? Is he giving them the freedom and the guidance that they need to actually get things done? So once our community realized that, we started to invest very heavily uh, in making sure that our leaders were very, very prepared for their tours. That being said, I never had one tour where I felt overly prepared for. I was always <laughs> wished that I had been more trained and better prepared. But in hindsight, uh, I think we do a pretty good job of getting people prepared for those roles. Okay. Yeah. I feel like you're always going to be stuck in that vortex when you're preparing to, to go to these kinetic areas and kinetic situations. So this is kind of an extension of that discussion because obviously you, you got out of the Navy SEALs and we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. <clears throat> but from a civilian perspective, when we look at the military right now, it's kind of hard to see a lot of preparedness. It's kind of hard to see a lot of leadership. And part of that is because some of the signaling from the generals, they seem to be concerned about things that don't have to do with, you know, breaking stuff and killing people, which is kind of what you, what you do in war. It seems like they're very worried about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're very worried about <clears throat> getting that, the non-typical soldier like to come through or, and it just seems very odd from, from, from where I sit because it's like, wait a minute, I don't care how diverse our special operators are. I care about how good they are at their jobs. I care about how lethal they are. <clears throat> I don't care what the upbringing was like, or if, you know, this officer had two moms instead of a mom and a dad. Like, I care about if he can lead men well that, that are going to be going into battle because I want all of them to come home and I want them to take out the enemy. So let's go from you setting up this leadership program after you left that program, has it continued to get better? Has it gotten kind of weighed down in, in the bureaucratic nonsense of what we potentially see in Washington? Am I, am I drawing some conclusions there that aren't true? Uh, let, let's go ahead and set the record straight. Yeah, yeah, potentially. So look, this is maybe not the same verbiage that we're using right now with the uh, diversity and the inclusiveness and all that thing. But when there's not a war going on, People in leadership positions in the military have always historically shifted their perspective into to other things. Um, it's not new. World War II ended. There was a massive drawdown. Leaders, it's not all leaders, but some leaders started focusing on things that they probably shouldn't have been focused on that weren't involving being as lethal of a fighting force as we could possibly be. So that historical perspective has always been there. The, the war really... War really tends to, to put things in focus, shall we say, for, for leadership, usually. Um, as far as the training goes, as long as guys are running around on the beach in buds with a boat on their head and with logs, and as long as they're cold and wet and miserable, 
the SEAL teams are going to be just fine because that's the proving ground. And when you get into that community, all the guys on the ground want to do is they want to be the best SEAL they could possibly be. And that means being prepared at all times to, to kill the enemy and break his stuff. And our training is always going to be focused on that. So I don't think it's the training that I used to run. I don't think it's gotten worse. If anything, I think it's gotten better because I know the two and three individuals that took over the command since I've been there and they're phenomenal, stellar people. And I know they're just going to continue to whatever, hopefully good work I did while I was there. I know they're going to continue to just, to just build off of it. So at some point, does those messages become annoying to people on the ground? Yeah. Do we wish we didn't have to listen to some of those? Yeah. But uh, the standards have not changed. You're not getting through buds any easier. So as long as the guys on the ground are there, they're going to be focused on the right things. So you mentioned standards. I was about to move off, but you, you brought something else up because we do hear about the standards being adjusted so that more women can get through more, you know, anyway, it's typically on the, the female side. And so uh, I can't remember the, the details exactly, but I think there were a couple of females that made it through the ranger school or something like that. And then they were actually put out there with the Rangers and then they, they both quit. Cause they're like, this sucks. We can't do this. Like, you know, we were good enough athletes to get through the hard part and, you know, we were mentally strong, but when it came to actually doing the job, and I guess my biggest concern, Sean, is let's take 10 years from now. I mean, because the world 10 years ago, 2013, this is unrecognizable, the world that we live in culturally and politically. So let's go 10 years from now. And let's say they're forcing a female quota for, for the SEAL teams. I'm worried about someone like you getting shot, being unable to move, and a 125-pound female SEAL that looks good on a poster can't pull you out of harm's way. And then you both die. And so is there a concern? Is there a groundswell of concern within the teams that it's not just going to be board generals eventually, but this is just going to be this top down authoritarian focus to where it's like, Hey, seals, green berets, Marine recon Rangers. We need y'all to have more females. We need y'all to have this number of this many types of people when in describing their immutable characteristics, or do we always assume that, no, we're just going to look for the best and we're going to let the political commercials speak for themselves. Yeah. I, I, I can't speak for things that haven't happened yet. Um, I would hope that would sure. never be the case, but let's pretend that it let's let's say that 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 is the case. First, the when when they first started looking at women in the service in combat MOS is in the service. MOS is basically your rating. So then they expanded it to special operations forces and they asked all the special operations forces to basically give their their data. Um, a lot of other special operations forces in the in the U.S. military pushed back and just said no. What the SEAL teams did is I think mm. the smartest that you possibly could have done, which was, and I was at BUDS when this was happening, I was an instructor at BUDS when this is happening, was we codified our standard. And we said, awesome. Yeah, this is great. That's great. Women want to come be SEALs. Awesome. Here's our standard. Here it is. You make it, you're a SEAL. You don't make it, you're not a SEAL. Um, the Marines, Hey, no hit on the Marines that were the, the, that were there. Like this was a leadership decision. They had no, no choice in this, the guys on the ground, but the Marine special operations forces just, they basically did a bunch of tests and then they pushed back and said, you know, the data doesn't show that this is doable. So let's not do it. And then the military said, we don't care what your data shows it's happening. So our take of just codifying our, our standards was the best that we could possibly have. Because once the standards are codified, they're the standards. And there've been some women that have uh, tried to come through the pipeline, but they've not even got to, uh, to day one. There's a, there's a pre-screening that happens and I don't think anyone's even got to day one yet. But hey, in, in the odd chance that, that someone does make it through, what that would mean is that they made it through the standard. So it would be hard to push back against someone that made it through that standard. Um, I don't know if that'll ever happen or not, but if it did, in theory, they would have had to go through every single thing that, uh, everybody else went through. So in theory, the capability, the physical capability and the mental capability would at least be there. So that was our strategy on codifying the, the standard instead of just pushing back and saying, we don't want to, which of course, in a bureaucracy, uh, what are they, or in a, 
military hierarchy when you're like, well, we don't want to, well, we don't care what you want. Like we're making you do it. But when you have the standard, then that's the standard and that's the entry uh, to the organization from then on out. Now, as far as the attrition rate and things getting easier, if, <laughs> if anything, they've gotten a little bit at least harder because we had about three years where you were graduating, no joke, 11 people, 15 people. Wow. It's insane. Insane. So it definitely has not got easier. And it's also every SEAL's favorite pastime to say, well, my generation, my BUDS class was the last hearts BUDS class. I can right. tell you as someone who ran BUDS, not true. Uh, it's still exceptionally hard. We might not get to do everything that some of the old timers got done to them, but it's still exceptionally hard. And the last piece of this is, this is just my opinion on things. I don't think it matters who says what. As long as the the hairy chested frogman E6 is running buds as the instructor, buds will be just fine. All right. Well, that's good to hear. But let's transition to you transitioning out of the Navy SEALs. So as far as I understand it, you did 13 years uh, as a Navy SEAL. Is that correct? Correct. So 13 years. You hear a lot of stories about guys doing their 20 and their 20 is, you know, getting in 20 years and you hit all these different, you know, standards and for stuff for retirement and benefits and money and all that kind of stuff. Well, you got out seven years prior to that. So it wasn't exactly like you were just shy, but anytime a special operator gets out of whatever, you know, unit or platoon or whatever they're in, that's a big decision because it's not just, Hey, I want to do this with my life. It's like, Hey, these are my brothers. We fought in you know, bled together, you know, I've lost some of them and, you know, I, I can't just leave them hanging. You know what I mean? So, so why get out at the 13 year mark? Yeah. So a lot of different things were, were going on that kind of culminated in it, but it was a hundred percent the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my entire life. And I went back and forth on it for uh, over a year, but one of the, the main reason was, was family. And what kind of shined a spotlight on this was, I had a commanding officer when I was at SEAL Team 5, when I was a troop commander and went to Iraq. He was my commanding officer and he was just awesome. Just a great guy, a great leader in every aspect. And he sat me down one day and, uh, you know, when you're post troop commander, you're starting to now move into the realm where you're going to be an executive officer, a second in command of a SEAL team. A couple of years after that, you're going to be a commanding officer of a SEAL team. So, the community is starting to, to look very heavily at your career and where you need to go and what you need to do. So he sat me down and he's like, hey, let's let's just go through the next, you know, let's pretend like you're going to hit 20 years. Let's go through the next five tours that get you to 20 years. And let's just do an experiment where every tour is exactly the tour that you want. So walk me through where if you could do five tours, like where would your next five tours be? And I was like, man, this is awesome. Hell yeah. Well, I want to do this. Then I want to run the training command, which I got to do, which was awesome. I want to run the training command. Then I want to go do this. And then I want to be a commanding officer. And he's like, okay, great. That's awesome. So we got that mapped out. It's like, okay. Now do me a favor and write the age of your kids, the age that they'll be underneath every single one of those tours. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. So I started writing my kids' names under all those tours and the longer I went down that pipeline, the more my heart just started to sink because I'm looking at my kids who were then my oldest son was, oh my goodness, five, maybe five or six when I was doing this. And now I'm looking at a roadmap where when I hit the 20 year mark and I'm finally able to retire, my, my oldest son Ronan would be 18 years old when I finished that tour. So what that wow. meant was, what that meant was I would hit 20, finally have all this time to dedicate to my family and my son's out the door that same year. He's going to be off in college or whatever, if he even goes to college these days, who cares? But if he's going to be mm -hmm. out the house, sure. And he's going to be going and doing some other stuff. So that was the moment where the wheels started turning of, okay, two goals, be a good seal, be a good father be a good husband, be a good, have a good family. Um, and I started to see the world through the lens of it, it might not be possible to achieve both of those things. I'd at least be sacrificing on the family side. So the other thing that I had going for me that worked against me in the end, but helped me make the decision was 
I had had a little bit of a unique career path and I had moved through things very quickly. So there's certain wickets, if you will, that you have to hit as an officer um, if you want to keep moving up through the through the community. And I was very fortunate because I had very good advocates for me uh, in the community where I hit all of those wickets exceptionally fast. So I was a lieutenant commander in, in under seven years. I was spot promoted because the job I was in was lieutenant commander role. So I was a troop commander probably three years earlier than I should have been a troop commander. Um, I was the operations officer probably three years earlier than I should have been an operations officer. And in the Navy, your executive officer tour is a huge tour and it's usually done at like your 13 to 14 year mark. I did it. I was done with it in 11 years. So I was done with all of my big milestones uh, at the 11 year mark. And now I had nine years basically left on in my military life if I wanted to hit 20. And I knew that during that time, it would be a bunch of moves, a bunch of surprise deployments places. Um, in the chance that I would, the only tour that was left that I really wanted to do was a commanding officer tour. So I was going to stick it to my family for nine more years, just so that I could have two years worth of being a commanding officer. So when I looked at it like that, man, I got to do everything I wanted to do and more. The SEAL teams for me, I mean, it, it shaped the person that I am. And it, it was so much more than I ever envisioned it could possibly be. I had three absolutely amazing kinetic deployments surrounded by amazing people. I got to do a tour at the initial training command and get a peek behind the selection process. I got to be an operations officer and help run a team. I got to run all the training for the West Coast SEAL teams. Like what more can you ask for out of a career? So when I started to layer all those things together, Kyle, it made it easier to, to make the right call, which was put the family first, because not that I'd been sacrificing the family. I was a good family man, but I'm gone a whole lot of time. And I didn't want the formative years for my kids, for their dad to have an idea of what their dad was, but not actually know their dad. So uh, decided to, to make the jump. And the last thing that made it easier was, again, I've always had benefited from being blessed with good advocates and uh, I known Jocko um, before that, and when it came time for me to uh, to make the jump, you know, he extended an offer for me to go and and work with him and his team at Echelon Front. So it was like I have again providence, like God's hand, just guiding me through all of these different things. And then my off ramp was set. Like, what better community could you possibly be around after getting out of the military than to go and work with guys like? Chaco and Leif and JP and Jason and Steve and, and just all these amazing individuals. Well, see, so when you lay it out like <clears throat> Sean, when you lay it out like that, doesn't it sound cooler than, Hey, I used to play college soccer. See, I, I, I put you down a little bit at the beginning. It took us about an hour to build you back up, but here we are. So let's talk about that. You transition out of the military and it's no secret and it's no surprise to people that a lot of men, especially people from the spec ops community, they have a hard time transitioning because they, they lose the brotherhood. They lose the daily disciplines. They lose the, the predictability of their income or whatever the situation is. But you seemingly made a pretty smooth transition. I, I think you you worked uh, with a startup there for a little bit, but then you go work with Echelon Front and then we'll get more into uh, you know business that you're doing now. But what was that like? And, and do you almost feel guilty that some guys don't transition the same? Or is it like, hey, I got to worry about me and, and, and take care of business? I don't feel guilty, but I do feel I empathize with them. It's a it's a hard, hard decision. That being said, and this might come across as a little callous, and I, I don't mean it like that. But what were you cultivating when you were in the SEAL teams? I was cultivating sure. a family. I was cultivating really good friendships that I knew would endure in and out of the SEAL teams. And my identity when I was a younger man in the teams was definitely a SEAL. Like if I had worked so hard to get there, and if you had stripped me of that identity, it probably would have had devastating ramifications for my life. But with a, with a little maturity and a little grace, my identity was not fully wrapped up in being a SEAL. It was a huge part of my life. But a bigger piece of it was a more important piece of it was I was a father. I was a husband. I had other things that 
outside of that community. Now, almost all of my life revolved around the SEAL teams because it's all encompassing. But I think people that have a heart, and I also benefited that I knew what I was going to get to go do on the outside. I knew I was going to continue to be surrounded by good people. Now, that, again, was cultivated. I don't think, and I don't want people to take this the wrong way because it's going to come across as a, a little egotistical, but I, I don't, I genuinely don't mean it that way. I don't think I would have had the opportunity to work on the team at Echelon Front if I hadn't done some things right throughout my career. If I hadn't worked really hard, if I hadn't applied myself, if I hadn't strived to have the best reputation that I possibly could have, if I had been disciplined enough to do all of those things and to say no to things that were going to be a distraction, alcohol, drugs, whatever the case may be, I don't think I would have had that opportunity to transition in that. So I think a lot of times what people that struggle with the transition, it comes around to, to two things that I've seen. Um, failure to cultivate anything else outside of that identity and then failure to identify a mission before they get out of the military. And that mission for me was being a father. It could be being a police officer. It could be being a husband. It could be being a friend. It could be being a plumber, but you have to have some other mission identified before you make that switch or else, especially I think for men who really put a lot of value into the work they're doing and a lot of their dignity is wrapped up into the work that they're performing, um, if they're doing it right, at least. I think that's why people struggle is that they don't have a mission when they get out uh, and they've probably at some level failed to cultivate some pretty important things. And that's why when I was talking with guys in my platoons and my troop and I got the opportunity to talk about more than just work, I would try to caution people about what they were doing to their families, what they were cultivating on the outside, because it doesn't matter who you are. At some point in time, the community is going to say, thanks for your service, but you have to go somewhere else. And you're going to be left with whatever you either built or destroyed during that 10, 13, 30 years. So I think those are two reasons people struggle. I think you're right. And, and you brought up just the the whole provider aspect. I was just talking about this with my wife the other night, but you know, first Timothy five, eight, if anyone does not provide for his own and especially his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, just think about that. And then there's other parts of scripture talking about how you should leave your children's children an inheritance. And so that doesn't mean like, you know, to every woman out there that, Hey, you can't have a job and you can't, you know, run a business or you can't do whatever. Like, Hey, we just need you barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. That's certainly not what that means, but it does mean that we're going to have to answer someday mm -hmm. for how we led our households. Were we a spiritual thermometer or were we a spiritual thermostat? And all that goes in like the, the type of money you bring in the, the life that you create for your progeny is a big deal. And I do think that some people sell themselves short uh, when it comes to transitioning in any aspect, whether you're transitioning from your your graduate studies to the real world or whenever you go from the military uh, back to the civilian world, I, I think that, that that comes for all of us. So let's just do a little quick echelon front commercial because I think most people are familiar uh, with what you guys do, but you know, leadership training and development of staff and things like that. But I mean, y'all continue to balloon out from when it was, you know, just Jocko and Leif to there's certainly more of you doing this type of thing now. But what are the deliverables that Echelon Front brings to the marketplace? Yeah, the big deliverable and the, probably the first one to break down is a lot of times when we're working with with different clients and different organizations, some people are like, yeah, this is going to be great. And then there's some people who are like, oh, this is military style stuff. Like hmm. we're not a military. Um, it's absolutely not military leadership. Like, I think this is how most of us in the military wish that we were all led during our time in the military. And at times we got glimpses of this, but it's not military style leadership. What it is, is it's leadership training and a leadership challenge in the military is going to be the exact same, exact same uh, fundamentals of that challenge as it's going to be, whether it's a civilian job or whether it's in your personal life, because you're dealing with people. Military, dealing with people. Regular jobs, sorry, everybody, it sounds horrible when I say regular jobs. I mean non-military jobs. Right. Non-military right. jobs, uh, you're dealing with people. Your family, you're dealing with people. And people, in a lot of ways, are the same. And anytime you put a lot of us together, there's going to be challenges 
that we need to overcome, but there's also a whole lot of opportunity to get things done if we're leading effectively. And I think a lot of people put the focus in different areas uh, and not necessarily on leading. And the determining factor, whether you're going to be successful or not, is absolutely how well that you're being led. You can have the best widget or gadget on the planet, but if you don't have a good team that's being led well, that widget is never going to reach its its full potential. So we spend a whole lot of time talking to different companies and training different companies and teaching people how to lead because leadership is a skill. It's not like you're born uh, a leader. There's nobody that emerged from their mother's womb just ready to, to, to conquer everything. Like it's a skill. It's like any other skill. You can get better at it if you focus on it, if you learn about it, if you're disciplined about it, you can get better at leading. And when we work with these different companies, there's like a domino effect where everything just gets better. The leader who we're working with, their life gets better because now all of a sudden they're being more efficient. Their personal relationships are starting to bloom. They're keeping their plans more simple and people understand what to do, which means there's less problems for people to solve. And the people underneath them, their life is improving because now all of a sudden they're given some freedom. They're given some buy-in. They have a simple plan that they know what they need to do to execute. Their relationship with their chain of command gets better. And if your life at work is better, where else is your life going to be better? It's going to be better at home too, because I'm not going to carry all that stress and frustration from work back to my home. If my life at work is improving, then odds are I'm going to have a better life outside of work as well. And, and all of that really starts from a foundation of of being good at leading people. Very good. Well, Sean, we're well over an hour in at this point. We've talked about whiskey, cigars, sports, working out, the military, leadership, business. We've talked about it all. But I don't care about any of that stuff, okay? I just had to do all of that to set up for what we're going to talk about now because one of my favorite subjects on the entire planet to discuss is the consumption of delicious meat. So someone's going to clip that out later and use it against me, but I don't care. I don't care because the reason why we're hunters, the reason why I'm literally leaving from this interview to go hunt is because that's how we get protein, the best protein possible. But the problem that people run into, Sean, especially with beef, is where in the world is this beef coming from? Like what has been put in this beef? Like what's going on with it? Why does it taste so funny? I had a family member, right? Uh, her or the, you know, the husband and wife, they, they got with another couple. And I think they bought either a half cow or an entire cow. And lo and behold, it was an old bull that got delivered to them. The steaks were atrocious. Even the, the burger, even the ground was just gross. But somehow, Sean, you go from the soccer pitch to the Navy SEALs, to the boardroom, and now you're running perhaps the best beef operation in America right now, the beef delivery operation, we should say, called Primal Beef. So guys that have been listening to this for any length of time, you guys have heard me talk about Primal Beef before, but this is your baby. This is your company. So that's not exactly a normal transition, Sean, to go from the life that you've done into the cattle business. And you mentioned way back at the beginning of this episode, y'all had animals growing up, but one of the only animals you didn't have was cattle. And so how in the world did you end up doing this, Sean? Yeah, again, you, d- the Providence. So when when we got out of the, the military, we moved to a town in Virginia, right in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley called Front Royal. And the reason we chose Front Royal is my wife's family over the last probably nine years now has been kind of moving one at a time to this town. So my wife's one of eight and they grew up in the Northeast in, uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, and then her, her brother-in-law and sister moved here. And then her parents moved here and then another brother and his wife uh, and their two kids moved here. And then some other siblings moved to like the DC area, which is right outside about an hour away. So this became the hub of all things family for us. So we've been coming to this town for seven or eight years, visiting a couple times a year, seeing family. And man, it was just amazing. It was like a little microcosm of like Mayberry back in the day from the Andy Griffith show. It was like still, still that people caring about each other, people looking out for each other, just good, hardworking Americans. And we, we kind of fell in love with it. And, and we bought some land out here and moved out here. And one of the guys that I had met 
through friendships through our church was a guy named Paul and he was a cattleman and you know I bought uh, a cow from him very similarly to what your your friend did only this was not that type of cow this was the best steak I had ever had in in my entire life when, when we purchased this this beef from him and I still remember sitting at the table after cooking the first steak and I took about three bites and I looked at my wife who always sits to my left and I said this is the best steak I've ever had in my entire life, like hands down. Um, I have five kids. We eat a lot of beef. So that cow didn't last very long. So I, I called Paul mm -hmm. back up and we got another cow. And lo and behold, it was the exact same quality, the exact same flavor. It was just a repeat performance. And uh, that's what kind of got the gear turning is, hey, this is amazing, high quality, all natural beef. And it's almost sinful that we're not offering it to other Americans, that we're kind of just keeping it to ourselves. So again, being very blessed with uh, good friends and, and good mentors, I called Jocko up and just said, hey, you know, what do you think about starting up a, uh, a beef company? And let me tell you why I'd like to do this. And he was all on board. He's like, absolutely. Guy eats a lot of steak too. So I think he wanted to support. Mm. I think also it was selfish. He wanted just cows That's on right. cows on in his house. Yeah. So, that kind of started uh, the journey of just wanting to bring this same amazing beef that we had available to us, bring it to other hardworking American families who just through con or through proximity would never get to experience something like this. If you live in New York City or Houston or Atlanta or, or San Diego, like you're just not surrounded by farmers who are pouring their heart and souls into all these different animals. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about primal beef is all of our cows come from one farm. All of our cows are raised the exact same way. They're all American black Angus. They're all raised the exact same way. And what that means is every time you order from primal beef, you're going to get the exact same flavor, the exact same quality and the exact same consistency. So that was really the driving desire behind it was to just feed Americans and feed Americans something that they can feel good about putting on their plate. They can feel good about getting people together to, and breaking bread over. Okay. So a couple of questions on that. Cause I'm, I'm already starving, right? Cause I'm fasted right now. I've already worked out, you know, it's mm -hmm. almost lunchtime. So this is really starting to bother me. So we, we might need to speed this up here towards the end, but I don't understand. And, and maybe you can't reveal any of the secrets. Cause you know, maybe one of those other companies is listening right now is the how because i've gone like how does it taste so good because yeah. from you guys i've had the new york strip steak the ribeye steak a, i don't even know how to pronounce it a bavet steak bavetti bavet never even seen that cut that was fantastic and it was like the perfect shape to to cook consistently i've had the tri-tip and i've had the burger and i even told you i was like sean don't send me any of the burger I, i'm not gonna eat any of that i've got all that and then you sent it to me and then i had it and i was like okay okay what is what is going up going on with the beef because i've been to the the fancy uh meat places where you pay a very very large sum of money to get a very mediocre piece of beef and sometimes you get a very good piece of beef but guys if you just go to your local supermarket it's kind of like russian roulette you don't know anything about that beef you don't know what farm it came from. You don't know what types of hormones or, or vaccines or anything that has gone in there. You don't really know if it was grass fed or grain fed or finished. Or you don't know any of those things. And so sometimes you'll just get a piece of meat that just isn't as good as the last one you got. And you just kind of throw your hands up and go, I guess I'll try again next time. So how is it so consistent? I, I, I don't know anything about uh, being a cowboy or a cattle operation or any of that type of stuff. How can it be consistent from cut to cut to cut? box to box to box. Yeah. What it really comes down to is they're eating the same thing. So all the cows are all the same uh, basic genetics and that they're all black Angus. So a lot of the steaks mm -hmm. that you get when you go to a store, depending upon what your store is, and I'm not saying every butcher shop is like this, but if you're going to a grocery store and you're paying, you know, five, seven, $10 for a steak, that's not Angus. That was probably actually a dairy cow that was no longer producing milk and like they're not going to just continue to let that cow live a nice life so they're going to process that cow that's not a beef cow that's a dairy cow and they're going to get as much money return as they can on that so 
one, Angus was developed, literally developed for rich beef flavor and marbling. So you've got the genetics of the cow itself. And then you've got where we live in the Shenandoah Valley. And it's one of the, of the, if not the most lush places in the United States of America. And what do cows eat? They're eating grass. And these pastures are just overflowing with all these native grasses and clovers and everything that a cow needs to really nutritionally uh, thrive. And they're, they live a very nice, easy life. They're not moving around a lot because everything is so lush that the cows don't really have to work super hard for their food. And what I mean by that is ranches out west are massive because out west is a little more arid. Things don't grow in as, in as much of an abundance. So if you need to feed a thousand head of cattle, you need 30, 40,000 acres to do that because you're going to have to move those cattle uh, almost every day to, to allow them to graze and get enough forage. Here, that's not what happens. Uh, you can have a whole bunch of cattle in a, in a much smaller proximity because the pastures are just so lush. And a big reason for that is the Chesapeake watershed comes way into the area of where we are, into this valley, and then the Shenandoah River runs right through it. You've got the Blue Ridge Mountains on the right and left side, and you've just got this real unique little microcosm uh, where things just thrive. Like, I have cows on my property, my own personal cows on my property. I still have to go out there with my tractor and mow my property at least twice a year because they just can't eat enough grass to keep everything down through certain parts of the year. So that's the first thing is they're all eating these things that they're all growing up on what they should be growing up on and they have it all in abundance. The next piece is, you know, what are you, what are you finishing the cattle on? And there's two methods to finishing cattle. One is uh, grass fed. So they're fed grass their entire life. And then the other method is typically you're finishing them for some period of time. Some cattle, all they eat is grain uh, for some period of time on a grain or a blend of grains. And what a cow is eating obviously is going to affect the finished product of the cow and what its meat uh, tastes like. So same thing, if you went and shot a, a buck in South Texas, even though it's genetically the same whitetail, it's going to taste very different than if you go to Nebraska and shoot a buck that's been just eating corn out of people's uh, farms its entire life. So what the animal eats affects the way that it tastes and affects the tenderness of the beef. And the all of our cattle eat this really, really unique blend. So they're raised on grass. And then for the last about 200 days, they're also supplemented. So they're still eating grass, but they're supplemented feeding with a blend of distiller's grain and produce. So like fruit and vegetables that markets bring to the farm. So markets, you can only keep fruit, vegetables, pineapple produce on the shelf for so long before they bring new stuff in. So the farmer takes all of those, blends it up with this distiller's grain that he's growing on his property. And then it basically becomes a mash. And that's what the cows are supplementing with. And that's one of the reasons why the meat is so tender and has such a, not just an amazing flavor, but a, a very unique flavor because of that distiller's grain and then the fruit, all the sucrose from the fruit and the vegetables that they're getting, uh, that they're getting to eat. So that's the first two pieces that have the biggest impact to the meat is how they're raised, where they're raised, what they're getting to graze and then what they're finishing. And then I'll take a pause and then we'll talk about the last piece, which is what happens when you process the cows. Well, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. I did just want to kind of reiterate something you said about the uniqueness. Like I remember like the first time that I had elk, I had an elk steak and I was like, whoa, like what, what is this? Because typically when you're preparing something like a barbecue or something like that, you're, you're getting a lot of that seasoning. You're trying to figure out the bark and the crust and all those different things. But I cook my steaks the exact same way each time. I, I bring them up in a convection oven to about 100 degrees. I have a cast iron skillet about as hot as it can go. I either put tallow, which primal beef needs to start selling. I'll either put tallow or butter down. And then I'll do like 45 seconds per side uh, to, to get that sear. And the only seasoning I put on it is cracked pepper, coarse salt, and garlic powder every time. But the very first time, I think the first steak I had was ribeye uh, from you guys. And I bit into it. I was like, 
okay, so, something's different about this ribeye. And I've had some fancy ribeyes and I've had some absolute dog crap ribeye, ribeyes. Mm. Dog crap may have actually been better than some of the, these ribeyes. And then I just kept eating through it. And I'm like, this, this doesn't make any sense. Maybe I got a good one. And then I did the New York strip. And then I did the tri-tip and like, I never done a tri-tip before. So I had to learn all these different methods. And every time along the way, it, I can absolutely co-sign the uniqueness of that. So I appreciate you getting into the details of step one and step two that really lead to that. But I here, don't let me <laughs> keep going on yeah. and gallivanting around about, about the particular yeah. <laughs> beef itself. Let's talk about the processing. Yeah. So processing is, is the last piece where everything comes together and it can, it can make or break, uh, all the hard work that's been put into the beef up until now. So we partnered with a kind of boutique processing plant facility down here that's in Lynchburg, which is about uh, two hours away from where we live. And it was a couple of a guys, young guys, hard chargers that bought this plant that had been around for about a hundred years and it had fallen on some hard times and, and closed down, I think in the early eighties. And they, they had a vision for bringing this plant back, for providing jobs to the local economy, to getting a little bit of respect back in like the butchering game. And they bought this place and they completely renovated it themselves. And it's called Seven Hills Abattoir. So we met with them. We told them without telling anyone who was involved, we told them kind of what we were looking to accomplish and had some conversations with them. And in the conversations, we really started to like their vision. We really started to appreciate them for who they were as entrepreneurs and as men trying to start this thing up. And then it came out that without them knowing that uh, Jocko was involved at all, that they were both huge fans of extreme ownership. And like, that's how they ran the business. I was like, done deal. Like, this is it. This is all the layers right. that we needed to see. So what they do that's very unique is they dry age the whole carcass. And when you're finishing beef, there's two different ways of, of aging if you're even going to age. Some beef is not aged. The good thing about aging is what you're doing is you're breaking down enzymes. The tenderness level is increasing. Lots of good things are happening. There's two methods that are typical for dry aging or for aging. There's dry aging and wet aging. What they do is they dry age. So they take the whole carcass and it dry ages in a big freezer for somewhere between 14 and 20 days. And during that time, everything in the carcass is, is breaking down in unison. All the enzymes are doing what they need to do to tenderize the beef and to really increase the rich beef flavor. And then they, from there, after that whole carcass has been dry aged, then they process it. They hand cut everything into the finished cuts like your bavette, your ribeye, all those other things. Their, their butchers do all of that. The reason that's very unique is it takes a whole lot of space to dry age a whole carcass. So if you imagine every day you're processing more cattle, you need vast amounts of space if you're going to keep a whole carcass aged for 14 days. Because let's say some of these big plants, you know, they're killing, they're processing a couple thousand beefs a day. Mm. You can imagine the warehouse space you would need, the cold storage space you would need. Let's just say for 14 days at 500 a day, that's 7,000 beefs that you would have hanging and you would need space basically like an Amazon fulfillment warehouse probably to handle right. that beef. Right. So they just don't have the space to do it. So what they do is a process called wet aging. Wet aging, and I'm not trying to knock it, I just don't think it's as good as dry aging and I think the proof is in in the the finished product. Wet aging means they they kill the animal, they cut into the animal, they put all the different cuts. So they process all the different cuts. So you've got your ribeyes broken down, all of that. And then they put those individual cuts in a vacuum seal and they vacuum seal it. And they put those on a shelf in a very organized fashion that doesn't take up a lot of space. What it's wet aging in is it's wet aging in its own blood. And the blood is what acts as the enzyme that breaks everything down. So Seven Hills, the best beef you can get is dry aged. And Seven Hills was not trying to be the biggest processing plant they could be. They were trying to be the absolute best processing plant they could be. They were trying to deliver the best finished cuts that you could possibly deliver. And that's why we wanted to partner with them is everything that we have done with Primal Beef, we've done with the end user in mind. We wanted every single family's, every single person's experience from the time they got on the website to when they saw that awesome black box on their door 
to when they prepared their first beef. We wanted every single touch point that they had with primal beef to be as good as it could possibly be. So we chose to partner with Seven Hills because everyone that we talk to, they're the best in the business. And I think that translates in the finished product. I certainly think it does as well. I co-sign all three of those steps because somehow that all coalesces in a delicious uh, side of beef that you can feed yourself and your family. But speaking of feeding families, one more thing before we get you out of here. <clears throat> I always like when companies have some sort of philanthropic thing that they do that actually makes sense with what it is that they do. So some people have a certain business and their philanthropic endeavor isn't like a, a direct line of correlation. I was like, oh, there's something weird happening here. But you guys are feeding American families that, you know, pay for the right to have that black box show up on their front door and then they get to enjoy it. But one of the aspects of what you all do is with each box that is ordered. So that includes my audience, you guys that have, you know, taken my promo code and plugged it in at the Primal Beef website and got that that actually sent a portion of that cow or whatever cows or whatever to an American family, but specifically a family of a special operator that is now retired or something like that. And that's through the C4 foundation. So tell me a little bit about the C4 foundation, kind of how you guys got involved and specifically what you deliver to these families. Yeah. So it was very important to, to all of us that are involved. Um, myself, Jocko, Paul, my brother Declan are the, are the, the team that founded Primal Beef. It was very important to us to be able to also be a blessing with the business. And uh, because of my background and Jocko and our, our shared background, I wanted to do something that would directly affect guys that had, that put a lot on the line for, for the country and not only them, but their families who also sacrificed a tremendous amount uh, for, for all of us. So the C4 foundation is named after Charlie Keating, the fourth, which is why it's C4, Charlie, the fourth. Um, he was a teammate of mine. He was killed overseas in Iraq. We actually, my troop, when I went to Iraq, it was his troop that we were replacing in theater. So he was killed a few months before we showed up uh, in a massive firefight against the Islamic State where a handful of team guys, I think it was 18 team guys during this, uh, ISIS basically did a massive operation and they tried to push forward and gain some new territory. And these 18 team guys were, were there uh, and they held the line, you know, killed over a hundred guys. And on that deployment, you know, Charlie was killed in one of those big firefights. So his, his father, who's a, a great man started uh, a nonprofit in his name, in his honor, the C4 foundation. And what they do is the reason that I really love uh, Mr. Keating and what he's done is as a community, we have a lot of different, nonprofits that that offer aid to SEALs and to special operators. What I really appreciate about Mr. Keating's is I don't think there's one out there that has more of a direct impact on the lives of special operators and their families. So he started this 500 acre ranch in San Diego and set it up to basically be an oasis for operators where they could come with their families and get whatever resources they needed and help they needed and aid they needed, even if all that meant was they just needed a weekend away from life in the teams to decompress. But they've got therapist and brain health and uh, performance coaches and jujitsu coaches and bo they got everything you could possibly need. And it's all aimed at just taking care of these guys. So I called him up. Uh, actually, I called my first platoon chief, who I, I love very much, is now working for the C4 Foundation. So I called him up. And just ran this idea through through him and said, hey, here's what I want to do. We just started this business. I would like for every box that we sell, we're going to set aside a cut of beef. And I would like to, to donate that through the C4 Foundation directly into the hands of special operators, active duty special operators. Uh, and Mr. Keating was was all about it. So now what we have is anytime anyone purchases a box, we take a cut of beef and we set it aside and at the end of a quarter, we compile all those cuts and we deliver it to the C4 Foundation and to some teams out here on the on the East Coast as well through the C4 Foundation and disseminate those be that beef right into the hands of special operations members and their families. And something that I, I want to point out is, uh, hey, give charity. So that so, you know, obviously people know what we're doing, but the model was 
give charity, actually give charity. Don't try to play games. Don't try to hide it. Don't charge the customer for the cut of beef. Just not tell them that you're charging them for the cut of beef. So like there's no games or no showmanship with, with this donation. You buy a box. We are setting a cut of that beef aside that's costing Declan, Paul, Jocko, and myself money. That's money coming out of our pockets that we want to go towards those family members. And we just did, we've only really been in business since the very beginning of August. And we just passed the three month mark, the first quarter. So we compiled our first shipments and we just shipped, uh, donated over 600 pounds of beef directly to special operators. And all of that wow. was made possible by everyone out there who's buying boxes and supporting us. I absolutely love that. Again, if you can deliver a product to somebody that they want, that you sell, that is a great thing. But if you can leverage that product to where it could lead to human flourishing somewhere else, that's the ticket. And that's, uh, that's what we've tried to do with Undaunted Life. I'm glad to hear that with Primal Beef. But Sean, we went quite a bit longer than I was expecting for us to, to go, but you said you didn't have anything going on this morning. So I decided to take a whole bunch of diatribes and, you know, go down different rabbit trails, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, man, just, Hey, I have truly enjoyed uh, getting to know you. I truly appreciate every, everything you're doing for our country. I truly appreciate everything you're doing for, for me and Jocko and Paul and Declan with, with primal beef and, uh, just blessed uh, to have you as a friend, Kyle, and I appreciate you bringing me on here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Sean Glass, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Sean Glass. I certainly did. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got three links for you today. I've got a link to the Primal Beef website. I think I said it wrong at the beginning. I think I said it was primalbeefco.com. It's just primalbeef.com. You guys would have found it eventually. Also, I've got a link to the Echelon Front website so you guys can check that out for more leadership training. And then also a link to the C4 Foundation that we discussed later in the interview. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song per Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>